As many know, the main storylines ahead of the 2023 WBA free agency surround the impending race to sign superstar Brianna Stewart, as well as Courtney Vandys- Vandersloot's looming decision to return to Chicago or head elsewhere. Here at Locked Women's Basketball, we pride ourselves on covering not just star-level talent, but potential sleepers that could make a real impact on a contending team, as well as playoff hopefuls on the margins. So on today's show, we're going to do just that by diving into some under-the-radar free agents. Locked Women's Basketball starts now. Ogumba Wallet for the win! You are Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Welcome. You are Locked On Women's Basketball. My name is Hunter Cruz, and I'm the Saturday host covering the WBA draft and college basketball at large. But this isn't Saturday. Uh, I'm stepping in for Howard on this one, and uh, me and Joshua are going to try to we're going to try to um, bridge the gap here and talk about some fr- some free agents. And but first, thanks for making Locked On Basketball your first listen every day. And remember, Locked On Basketball is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. And like I said, I'm joined by Joshua Well. Joshua is a women's basketball content creator. It can be found at ENFP underscore hoops on Twitter. So Joshua, we we like following like, oh, Candace Parker, is she going to return to Chicago? Or is Can- Can- like you've said many times on this show, is Courtney Vandersloot going to Seattle? Or is she yes. returning? <laughs> or or, or Azrae Stevens, is she going to Atlanta? These these are many scenarios. One we've th- Perfect. Yeah, <laughs> we, we've, th- we've thrown these same scenarios out here on the show. But today we're going to step back a little bit and go to some more under-the-radar players that you aren't really hearing as much in free agency discussion ahead of next month. So to classify a player as under-the-radar, we're going to exclude players that have like an expected value of $100,000 according to Spotrack's free agency tracker. This is just like an arbitrary value just so we can figure out, okay, who's who's defined as under-the-radar? Because if we if we had it up to ourselves, it could, it could be uh, iffy, and there's um, many ways to opinionate it. So this is just really a way is. for us to keep it consistent. So that being said, we'll go into our first player here, and that's Lexi Brown. She was at Los Angeles this past season. She's bounced around a lot of places. Um, shooting specialist, five foot nine, twenty eight years old. She averaged seven point one points, two point three rebounds. And 2.1 assists on nearly 40% shooting from three. So, with the way the WBA is trending, there's many teams that could benefit from having a shooter like Lexi Brown. Um, some of the many contenders I consider is Phoenix, for example, if they do not retain a uh, key and nurse, Sophie Cunningham. Those are just a couple of players that have free agency coming up. I, mean, I, know, I know Sophie's restricted, but she could get a bigger offer elsewhere. Um, additionally, there's like Indiana, Washington. Where do you think Lexi Brown's like a potential fit this this summer? Because she could head she could head somewhere else instead of Los Angeles, especially after last season. Yeah, I I definitely see. Well, I hope that Los Angeles goes a, a different direction, and I'm, I'm not getting full on into this. Don't get me started, but I, I just hope Kennedy gets playing time. But um, back to Lexi Brown, um, I don't agree with the Atlanta take. Like I don't, I don't know. Like I would want Ryan to be like the the main shooter so yeah just someone that needs like another high volume shooter off the the bench i I, i'm thinking maybe yeah i don't know what the connecticut sun's philosophy is going to be but like outside of heideman like who who else do they have right now that could um come on like when they're streaky like i don't know i think that one might be a good fit it's really hard to say fits when so many players are circling around this free agency like i I think these players it's going to be more interesting to see where the high profile free agents go and and then it will sort itself out from there and what teams could be in contention for these i don't know if uh, lexi brown's going to be one of the first signings over the offseason i think teams will go elsewhere first and then she would be a great second option what's your opinion on do you see her as a a starter in the w or do you see her um, as someone that's like first off the bench like i do so she's probably a bench plug, but she brings some value as like an her her ability as just some passing, I think as well. 
She does not get to the free throw line at all. So I probably don't say she's a starter. That's a main thing. Like it's like 0.3 attempts per game or something like that. So she's probably more of a, a bench piece that can kind of fit around some starters. And my thing with her in Atlanta is you can never have enough shooting. And that's exactly what uh, Lexi Brown is. But like you said, I think how this free agency is going to go is teams are going to look to see how everything shakes out with the stars because a team like Chicago can't really sign Lexi Brown when they don't know if they're going to have Candace Parker or if they're going to have Courtney Vandersloot. Yeah, or so, Avery Stevens. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, like all those players that are free agents, they're not going to sign a role player. Whenever Lexi Brown, someone's going to fit around them, not not going to be the person that's going to uh, be complimented. So she's one player that is is really going to depend on what happens with free agency. But she's Atlanta, Phoenix, Indiana, and Washington. Some teams that were at the bottom of the league last season in shooting, and Lexi Brown's a really good shooter. So I know you want to talk about uh, Laisha Clarendon, five foot nine guard. 31 years old. She did not play in the W last season, but in 2021, she averaged 10.4 points, 5.7 assists, and 3.1 rebounds, and she started 21 of 22 games. So what do you think her the market is for her heading into this offseason? So, yeah, it, it was an absolute uh, shame, like just how she turned around the Minnesota Lynx season the, two seasons ago, like flat out brought them to the playoffs. They were a disaster. Um, before they came into the lineup and to like we never got clarity on what happened at that situation did they actually have an injury uh yeah so they they clearly have what it takes and this is someone that i think is depending on which team they're on uh they could potentially be a starter with who they're with like um atlanta had the worst the uh, assist numbers like just <laughs> across the board um, just really struggled and it's a shame with the caliber of players that were on that team I, I honestly would not mind them making a, a return to the Atlanta dream uh, that's someone that I would be curious to, to see if uh, there's some mutual interest there definitely some value there so we'll see I th- for sure I, th- I think they do we'll see An- another really quick another player um, that I'm thinking of that got cut from the Minnesota Lynx uh, Crystal Dangerfield like it absolute it's just wild to me that um, she wasn't given a full-time contract, like played the majority, like played a little bit with the fever and most of her time was with the New York Liberty. That's someone else. I, I'm wondering if they can carve a spot. Um, two seasons ago was a, a little rough. And then last season she had her ups and downs, but I, I definitely think she's worth taking a shot on uh, another, this another player that you could take off the bench and could be a spark. I, I thought she was decently productive in her role. Yeah, being a backup in the league is so difficult. They bounce around oh, yeah. so much. It, it's crazy. But coming on, sure, we'll continue looking into some free agency sleepers. But first, let me tell you guys about BetterHelp. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available at 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist if things aren't clicking You can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash locked on MBA. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P slash dot com slash locked on MBA. Thanks for making Locked On Women's Basketball your first listen today. For your second listen, check out Locked On Sports today from the games that matter most. To the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and analysis only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports today, today, available on this app, YouTube, or wherever you ever get your podcast. So we're back, and let's get into Maya Caldwell. She kind of jumped onto the scene with Atlanta, 5'10 wing from Georgia, 24 years old. Very much a do-it-all wing. She came in, averaged 10.9 points, 2.4 rebounds, 2.2 assists on 51, 56, 80 shooting splits in nine games. Very much a small sample size, but she was extremely efficient and kind of filled in where she needed to be because I'm pretty sure she had a couple stints. She got she played like four games, got cut, came back again, and really filled in with a role. So 
what were your thoughts of Maya Caldwell this past season? And what are you, where are you seeing her heading into this off season, her uh, evaluation? Okay. First off, sorry, this is coming from a dream fan. So can't help bring this up again, but um, she absolutely should have made the roster from day one, um, especially um, the lack of uses usage for mom premiere. Uh, like we had times, especially how long it took Tiffany Hayes to come back into the lineup. She's someone that really could have added depth right away and would have earned more playing time just with the competition, the compete level she plays with and just how efficient she was, especially in her second stint with Atlanta. Um, with players that have shot at least 30 attempts, she had the second best three point percentage in WNBA history. Again, small sample size, but um, she's been killing it overseas as well. Um, she had an injury that cut, her season short, but she it's uh, a foot injury that at least I looked it up. She should be definitely ready for training camp. I, I don't see there being any issues there, but um, she's ready to play. And yeah, I, I think she's going to be competing for a starting role. And I, I would be deeply sad if the dream did not give her a full chance this time. If, if Atlanta doesn't uh, yeah, I, I think she showed enough to, for someone to give her a true shot. What are your thoughts on her? So uh, there's there's many teams that could use her service, and like you said, Atlanta ret returning to Atlanta is a a real option for her, as well as Los Angeles if they decide. I mean, not not Los Angeles, but Las Vegas as well. Both teams honestly could use shooting. Um, and with Las with Las Las Vegas specifically, Raquana Williams, they probably won't be able to retain her just because of salary cap situations. So being able to get another shooter on a cheaper deal, and I don't expect Caldwell to just generate like more than a major deal. It, I don't. I don't expect her to, to um, generate a major deal in free agency. Probably closer to the minimum contract, and that's exactly what Las Vegas could provide. And like you mentioned with earlier with Connecticut and Lexi Brown, Connecticut could be in the market for Mike Caldwell. I mean, they need another shooter. Um, we'll see what the what direction they go in with their um, new head coach and everything. But my main takeaway with Maya Caldwell is she's just such a good fit with any team. I think I could see her pretty much anywhere. A minimum contract, that value is absurd for me. Quick I, I don't know how though, I do not think she is going to just get a minimum contract. I think she showed enough that I think she's going it, – it's definitely not going to be three figures, but I'm, I'm thinking closer to 80 to 90, like closer to like a – a rookie contract would be just pushing towards the three figures. Cause I think like you said, there's a lot of, that'd be big. That that'd be big. What she could do. I, I don't know. I, I think there's going to be competition to um, have her join their team. And yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting. She's going to be one yeah. of the more fascinating players to watch, especially like we mentioned earlier, when um, top tier free agents are taken and everything. And another player is Ariel Garantes. She was with Los was with Los Angeles a couple years back, but she really drew eyes this past summer. And it was going into the fall with Puerto Rico in the FIBA mm -hmm. World Cup. 18.2 points, 6.5 rebounds, and 3.5 assists on 46, 27, 74 splits in 30 minutes per game. The main concerns with her is just the efficiency. That's what she was doing as a rookie. She wasn't extremely efficient. Uh, dating back to her time at Rutgers, she was never really a, an efficient scorer. But at 25 years old and with her pedigree as a prospect, there's definitely some intrigue with her. So where do you think her value is? Do you think she's going to get a contract ahead of training camp? Or do you think she's going to like kind of fill in around training camp and fight for a spot like last minute like we see with a lot of players? She's really interesting and – it's really hard for players that are high volume shooters, like you said, um, that got the shot attempts to produce the numbers like equivalent to be productive. It, it's really hard going into a situation where you're having to put up the numbers to be useful in much more limited minutes. And that's something I'm wanting to see that if that improves, like, cause overseas and in Puerto Rico, uh, should, like she got the minutes again. She was like one of the primary players like that their team was running through. So it's going to be interesting because she's definitely not going to get that in the W uh, right away. 
I think she gets, man, I, I, it's probably going to be a training camp contract. Like as much as I want her to sign a contract, like during the free agent period, uh, yeah, I, I see it happening closer to training camp um, after the draft or closer to that. Uh, teams will just want to see where they're at, but I definitely think a, a team should take a shot on her, but yeah, that's going to be another interesting player. What about you? What are your thoughts? So I, I would agree. I think she probably waits to, to to training camp. I don't think she gets like – because every year there's always those players that we, we consider on the edge. But there's some players that they'll get signed in free agency that are like – like we'll talk in a minute with Kia Nurse where she won't – I don't think she'll be on the edge of getting a contract. I think if she gets signed, she'll be on a roster. And with Garantes, I could see her anywhere. I think there's there's a lot of teams that could use her service. Um, just thinking off the top of my head, maybe Connecticut, maybe Connecticut. I don't know if that's something they would consider. It's another uh, bench plug score. Uh, it, it's really tough to fit with her. Maybe Dallas. I mean, maybe Dallas if they want somebody else. Dallas has too many things they they need to to figure out. Like their roster is already overloaded. They they need to decide who's a part of that future and. Uh, who they're going to let go. So that that's a whole, don't get me started on that. Let, let's move on before I, I get that motor. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's get, let's, let's get to Kia nurse. Probably the best player of this group. And she's going under the radar just because she was out with that ACL injury. But similar with Grantes, she was uh, a big, big piece to Canada in this past FIBA world cup, 11 point, uh, zero points, 2.4 rebounds and 1.0 assists. On 41, 35, 78 splits. And, yeah, she's she's still 26 years old. She's bounced around the league a little bit, um, six foot tall. There's a, there's a lot of intrigue with her. Uh, like, I, it, it's so up in the air with Phoenix because I she could return to Phoenix. She's only played one season there. She was productive in that one season, but it's such limited sample size. Exactly. We, we don't really know if that's, like, a long-term thing for her, but – um, she was on the bench the entire season with Phoenix, so I'm sure she likes the area and everything. So that's certainly an opportunity uh, for her there. A sneaky one for me is Minnesota, only because um, Nafisa Collier, she played with her at UConn, and then there's also that Canadian con- the Canadian connection with uh, Natalie Chanwa and Bridget Carlton. They could use shooting as well. So her strength in shooting is something that – it's it's a different um, – a different scoring avenue compared to aerial powers. Um, just as who's more um, going to create shots herself and in ball screens compared to a nurse who can play off the ball. So, where do you can where do you see uh, Kia Nurse head of this off season? Yeah, the links would instantly become Canada's team. <laughs> like oh, they, for they sure. Need to market that, but um, yeah. I agree she's going to be a player that will probably get a regular contract. She probably won't have to do a training camp contract. But again, being out last season, yeah, I don't even want to predict a a team yet for her because it's just another player that could fit in multiple situations. I I want to see how free agency pans out, but she's definitely a player um, that's going to be interesting to see how she does this season and hopefully with a larger sample size. So another player we're running through these is Maya Hong Shed. She was a surprise of last year's draft going in the first round of Las Vegas. Uh, six foot three forward, only 23 years old. Um, she was with Puerto Rico. So that's the last time we've seen her like, on a major stage uh, with Puerto Rico and FIBA. 13 point, 6.2 rebounds, 1.8 assists. Uh, the main thing with her is her outside shooting. She took 4.7 attempts per game from deep on 43% shooting. It was a little bit of a surprise considering most first-round picks end up getting signed. Disregarding the European players, there's some European players that will go first round um, but just don't come over. So I'm it was a little really unique. Big on Kone, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, it was a little unique for Maya Hongshed to not get signed at all uh, to an, any, any type of deal. I know there were some questions here and there about off-court stuff and everything, but – there, there's there's some teams that could definitely take a shot on a player of her caliber. So what were your kind of reactions to nobody signing her and then taking that over to how she's played in FIBA, overseas, uh, in Russia? I think it's Russia. I don't know why. 
But uh, what do you what do you what do you think about that? Yeah, like first off, going back to the draft, like I had her as a third round grade, so she it gave me the amount of shock that Lexi Hall uh, gave when the the Fever signed her. Like I I just thought this was out of nowhere, um, her being signed. I, I think this, yeah. I think she is going to be a training camp player. She's definitely going to have a chance to fight for a roster spot, but I, I don't see her getting a regular contract, obviously, because it didn't happen during the season last year. Uh, so, yeah, she'll definitely make a training camp roster as far as making the team or not. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, there's some intriguing prospects like we've been talking about every weekend. I don't know if she makes a roster spot or not. I, I personally would want to see her more overseas. Um Outside of FIBA, I didn't really watch her game much. Um, but, yeah, you just never know what players are doing behind the scenes. So it, it, it's just going to be if teams think she's going to be able to contribute in the roster or not. So, yeah. She did play on the Pac-12 network, a network I don't really get to watch. I haven't seen the Pac-12 network live ever in my life, but the Pac-12 network, that's where she played. Um, I've been so watching the- a lot more this season with – Games being on YouTube, but anyway, sorry, go ahead. But no, but you haven't watched the Pac-12 Network live. You've never oh, seen no. it live. Oh, yeah, no, I just watch replays on YouTube the next day, yeah. No. You're, you're just exposing yourself here, breaking laws here. <laughs> okay, You're after the break, we'll t- <laughs> posted, anyway. After the break, we'll take a look into, more, um, into one more player who was actually the number six overall pick a few years back. Is it time for her to return to the league? We'll dive into that in one minute. Pamela would hide in the office bathroom every 30 minutes to dry off her armpits so no one could see the wet circles under her armpits. She finally has her life back because of sweat block. Pamela was able to fix her, his, her um, problem with sweat block. Sweat block gives you the confidence to wear what you want without embarrassing uh, yourself with sweat. Sweat block wipes were featured and tested on Rachel Ray show by firefighters. If you or someone you love experimenting is experiencing embarrassing sweat or odor, try Sweatblock. Save 20% off with code locked on at sweatblock.com. Also available on Amazon. So like I said there, there's one player that we've yet to see return from the league, top six draft pick in 2022 by Minnesota, is uh, Makia Hebert Harrington, six foot two forward, 24 years old. She averaged 3.6 points in 2.2 rebounds in 10.7 minutes per game as a rookie. And then in the following offseason, she was traded from Minnesota to Seattle, but then missed the entire season due to pregnancy. So whenever she returned this past training camp, she did not make the roster and has yet has now returned overseas to London to play with the London Lions. And she's had a solid season over there. Um, so far in six Euro Cup games, she's averaging 17.2 points, 5.8 rebounds on 1.5 blocks, on 38% shooting from deep, and that also included a six for eight shooting from deep and against Sasari last month. And that team has some WBA players at her position in Joyner Holmes and Sam Thomas. So no, there's there's definitely some WBA competition over there, and that's who she's played against. So it's no, it's no slouch for, for example. And with Harrington, she was at South Carolina before. And why I think she has a role, and maybe it's only on a training camp contract, but she's super energetic. So I think she brings some value on defense. She moves well. She has length um, to block shots, uh, to contest shots. Uh, But also with her movement ability, it's what kind of is like her negative as well. She doesn't really align her feet when she shoots. It's she's so she's I, how I would describe it is she's very jittery. Her movement, her movement ability and patterns, um, nothing's very fluid. But um, she she's an energy forward with size and some versatility. And that type of player is interesting on a late contract. And I'm sure teams are still keeping an eye on her, given her uh, draft pedigree as the number six pick. So. I know you had another player you want to talk about that was um, overseas as well. We're just going to hit through these, some of these players here that uh, yeah going a little bit more um, to the radar. A, a player that was cut um, right around the same time as Maya Caldwell right before the, the season was uh, Nadia Jones. 
Uh, and she was on a three on three tournament uh, with players, Veronica Burton, Emily Inksler and Lexi Hall. So uh, just someone that's clearly uh, getting the pedigree to be in that tournament really good. And she's someone I am really going to be paying attention to in AU. And I'm really excited to see if she can uh, make a name for herself, like some players were last season and uh, potentially get a, another training camp opportunity. I, I, I I'll be really curious to see it. The FIBA website no longer had their sites, their stats up, but um, I thought she played really solid in like the games I was able to see. So uh, we'll see. So uh, lastly here, I was completely like unfamiliar with her game before I watched some of Harrington's game uh, ahead of this podcast. And her name's Holly uh, Winterburn, uh, extremely fun passer. She played her freshman season in Oregon in 2019-20. Um, she was at UC Davis for like a semester. No, no, not even a semester. She was like, she transferred at the end of the, um, her freshman year semester and then decided to go pro back to London. And she's five foot 10, only 22 years old, but she's an extremely fun passer. Um, the shooting's not amazing. She takes threes. She's extremely efficient at the rim, like 67% on twos. Uh, and, What's fun about her is just the European passing flash. Um, she slings one-handers, no look passes in transition. So I don't know if she's going to be a caliber player, but if she's someone that caught my eye. Obviously, not a lot of college production, and she's never. I don't, to, to my knowledge, she didn't get a training camp spot last year. She's probably already been drafted. I'm pretty sure she's probably already um, expired her draft eligibility. She was born in 2000, so I think she's fun. And I'm I'm, I'm trying to reach out to more people and see if there's anything there and if there's anything with her game. So So thank you for making Locked Women's Basketball your first listen. For your next listen, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast, the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. Available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts.